<clears throat> Welcome, everybody, and thanks for joining us. My name is Bernard Prusak, and I'm the director of the McGowan Center for Ethics and Social Responsibility at King's College, which is in northeastern Pennsylvania in Wilkesbury. The center is the host of this evening's event. This is our eighth annual Bassett Lecture on Medical Ethics. I had to go back and count. This lecture is named after Saint Brother Andre Bassett, who is the first saint from the Congregation of Holy Cross and the Congregation of Holy Cross sponsors King's College. From his post as a humble doorkeeper of the College of Notre Dame in Montreal, uh, Brother Andre Bissette became renowned as a healer. In fact, he uh, had to start seeing people across the street at the trolley station because he became so popular. And then eventually he finally was released from his duties as doorkeeper and assigned full-time as caretaker of the oratory of St. Joseph, again, across the street from the college. And he received their long lines of pilgrims. So we've named this lecture on medical ethics after uh, Brother St. Andre Bassett, who again became renowned as a healer. So it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker. So our eighth annual Bassett lecturer is M. Therese Lysot, who is professor in the Neiswanger Institute for Bioethics and Healthcare Leadership, Stritch School of Medicine, Loyola University, Chicago. Her scholarly work brings into conversation the fields of theology, medicine, ethics, and bioethics. Her books include Catholic Bioethics and Social Justice, The Praxis of US, U.S. Healthcare in a Globalized World, which she co-edited with Michael McCarthy, Caritas and Communion, The Theological Foundations of Catholic Healthcare, and On Moral Medicine, Theological Perspectives on Medical Ethics, which she edited with Joseph Kotba. Professor Lysot also consults widely with healthcare systems, and she serves on the editorial boards of multiple journals. She was recently appointed to the Pontifical Academy of Life for Life, which is quite an honor. So congratulations to you. Uh, Matthew Shea will be our respondent. Matthew Shea is assistant professor of philosophy at the University of Scranton, and he's new as of the fall to Northeastern Pennsylvania. So welcome. Uh, Matt and I have met other times on Zoom because of the pandemic. We've yet to meet in person in the flesh. And I imagine that's true for you and a lot of your colleagues at Scranton, even for that matter. I look forward finally to meeting at a, at a cafe. His areas of specialization include moral philosophy and biomedical ethics, in which he's published a number of well-received papers. Before joining the faculty at Scranton, Matt was a clinical ethics fellow at the UCLA Health System, a part-time faculty member at the Bioethics Institute of Loyola Marymount University, and a lecturer in the David Geffen School of Medicine, the School of Nursing, and the Fielding School of Public Health at UCLA. So let's just talk about some butts and uh, some nuts and bolts rather of this event. First, it's being recorded. And if I don't make too many more flubs, I'll post the recording on the McGowan Center's YouTube channel and also Facebook page. I'll probably do that later tonight. If you happen to be able to unmute yourself, which shouldn't be the case, please don't unmute yourself. If you happen to be able to turn on your video, and I don't think you should be able to do that either, in any event, please don't. Um, I'm going to disappear in a little bit since Therese will speak and then Matt will appear and uh, present his response. They'll engage one another for a few minutes and then I'll reappear and we'll do Q and A. So you're probably not to, new to Zoom, but just in case you are, we're gonna do the Q and A through the chat button, which is at the bottom of the screen. I've set that to host only. So I think you're able to chat only with me, Matt and Therese. For purposes of the Q and A though, send your questions to me. Uh, Matt and Therese will be quite busy. So send your questions to me and then I'll do my best to make sure your questions make it into the mix. So thank you to both our, our presenters. Thank you very much for uh, your time and, and I look forward to hearing your presentation and discussion. Thanks again. Take it away, Therese. Thank you, Bernard. Uh, and thank you all for coming on a 
Thursday night, early in February, uh, in the dark of winter. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. I really wish I was in Wilkes-Barre, um, again, visiting King's College. I was there actually in 2007 uh, through the uh, gracious invitation of Dr. Joel Schumann, who many of you know. Um, and so I hope to be able to come back and visit in person sooner than later. Um, but it's great that we can do this uh, in this alternative modality. Uh, I'm on the clock tonight, so uh, let us just get to it. Um, uh, <clears throat> and oh, I have to share my screen. Let's see if we can get our slides going. Uh, all right, and we're off. The spirit of revolutionary change. These are the first words of Leo XIII's encyclical letter, Rerum Novarum, which is generally marked as the starting point of the tradition of Catholic social thought. I took them as the title for tonight's lecture because back in 2019, when Dr. Prusak invited me to give the Bissette lecture, I had thought that I would spend this evening discussing my then recently published book, Catholic Bioethics and Social Justice, talking theoretically about the need to reorient and revivify Catholic bioethics by using the lens of Catholic social tradition. Such a lens, we argue in the book, is crucial for enabling us as Catholics, as bioethicists, as people who care about the moral dimensions of medicine and healthcare to begin to adequately understand both the complexity of issues encountered in the clinical setting, uh, issues such as the way that racial differences affect end of life decision-making or social dimensions of genetic technology, as well as to expand the scope of what counts as crucial ethical issues related to the practice of medicine and healthcare. Uh, issues such as, if you can read the extraordinarily fine print here called out from my table of contents, uh, issues such as gun violence, human trafficking, unions, uh, staff diversity, uh, the environmental impact of healthcare and its practices, just to name a few. So my plan had been to give an overview of our theory and then talk about an issue or two. Uh, and I was in the process of trying to figure out which issues to focus on when, of course, 2020 happened. Suddenly, we all found ourselves collectively immersed in what will likely prove to be the most profound healthcare issue of our lives. The COVID-19 pandemic ripped from our eyes, the veil that hid from most of us, the deeply social dimensions of contemporary medicine, and as if through a megaphone, shouted for a revolutionary change in how we think about and practice medicine so that we can name, address, and resolve the acute moral fractures that plague healthcare in the US and globally. And not only were we faced with a novel pathogen with a frightening array of clinical courses with essentially no effective treatments that spread like wildfire across the globe, we were suddenly beset by a barrage of ethical dilemmas and morally fraught realities. Let me run through just a few really quickly. This will be like bioethics speed dating. As the pandemic emerged last January, bioethics, both Catholic and secular, moved into high gear. Hospital ethics committees and emergency crisis management teams were mobilized. Pandemic protocols that were developed with the outbreak of SARS in 2002 and refined during the H1N1 epidemic in 2009 were unearthed, dusted off, and implemented. With few exceptions, the questions posed in the early phases of the pandemic concerned issues and decisions to be made within the clinical setting, and almost all of them were traditional questions regarding the allocation of scarce resources under triage conditions or end-of-life treatment. Questions such as, how should the few effective treatments that we have, including ventilators and ECMO and maybe patient plasma, be allocated to patients? Should we use SOFA scores uh, as this algorithm does? Comorbidities and other risk factors? Maybe age? Uh, how do we decide? Uh, questions continued. How should scarce protective equipment be allocated among frontline healthcare workers? In many ways, a new question in the United States. <clears throat> 
Could patient advanced directives be overridden? Given the high risk contagion, high risk of contagion, were healthcare personnel obligated to resuscitate patients who coded? Here, the traditional principles of bioethics, autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, and justice were used to develop allocation schemes that would maximize the benefit of medical treatment to individuals and society while treating patients and staff as fairly as possible. Interestingly, very quickly, shifts in the principles emerged with the principle of utility taking precedence while autonomy uncustomarily took a back seat. For example, some bioethicists floated the idea of a universal DNR proposing to categorically decide in advance that COVID patients would simply not be resuscitated if they coded, an idea which was quickly shot down by Catholics and others as discriminatory, counter to human dignity, and bad medical practice. Here, bioethics did what it had long been prepared to do, and it did it pretty well. But what quickly became clear was that the scope of the critical questions raised by the pandemic greatly transcended decisions in the ICU, and that the principles of bioethics were not sufficient to even to begin to address them. In almost an instant, for example, the location of bioethics was reconfigured. We suddenly saw, after we saw this familiar map day after day after day in the beginning of the pandemic, that the ICU at Wilkes-Barre General Hospital is intimately connected to Wuhan, China and Bergamo, Italy and Lima, Peru, and more. We also saw that the clinical setting could not be decoupled from local geographies as the pandemic unmasked the scope of systemic racism as a moral blight upon American medicine. Deeply troubling disparities in infection and mortality within African-American, Latinx, and Native American communities began to emerge as early as April. In November, 2020, researchers from Stanford and Duke University found that during the first six months of the pandemic, quote, black and Hispanic people who comprise 13 and a half and 18 and a half percent of the US population respectively, made up 58% of all patients hospitalized for COVID and 53% of those who died from the disease. These figures counted only inpatient deaths and only considered data prior to the much larger surges in infection and death in the second half of 2020 and into 2021. An important finding from this study was that these disparities were not rooted, as some hypothesized, in biological differences. The researchers did not find any racial or ethnic differences in mortality rates among the people who were hospitalized with the disease. Rather, they found that, quote, a disproportionate number of Black and Hispanic people became sick enough to require hospitalization and therefore made up 53% of inpatient deaths. So what was driving these extraordinary disparities in infection and severity? Two things. Existing racial disparities in the rates of chronic underlying medical conditions such as diabetes, high blood pressure, cardiovascular disease, and obesity caused by the social determinants of health were being complicated by socioeconomic factors specific to the pandemic, including higher rates of essential service work, inability to work from home, crowded living conditions, lack of access to personal protective equipment, and higher rates of uninsurance and financial insecurity. The researchers also note that these variations in mortality were explained more by, quote, site of care than by race or ethnicity leading to questions about the ways in which minority serving hospitals are resourced. In other words, what was happening in the ICU is a direct result of broader long-standing social and economic realities. These outcomes were not actually new. We have had all kinds of data on all kinds of health disparities for decades, but suddenly they became undeniably visible in a context where everyone was affected by the same disease. We also saw that our economic infrastructure was not only disproportionately killing people of color, it was also killing healthcare delivery. Decades of neoliberal economics had reduced public funding of healthcare, while hospital management had focused on cutting personnel, increasing efficiencies, 
and outsourcing services to other countries in order to maximize profit. This led to the bizarre paradox that as hospitals and health systems were being swamped with COVID patients, they were losing money and had to lay off healthcare workers. In June, the American Hospital Association projected that, quote, the total losses for the nation's hospitals and health systems would be at least 323 billion in 2020. As a result, between February and August, the US health sector laid off approximately 800,000 people. Were these among the 14.6 million Americans estimated to have lost their health insurance in the middle of a pandemic due to job loss? These same forces had long been decimating healthcare delivery in rural America as well, which now found itself bereft of hospital beds and healthcare personnel. These factors equally contributed to the devastating mortality in long-term care facilities. Not only were many facilities, especially for-profit facility, facilities, woefully understaffed with back-breaking patient loads per caregiver who often had no PPE, it became clear that many caregivers in these facilities were contract or part-time employees required to work for multiple facilities, unknowingly spreading the virus from facility to facility to facility. And of course, many of these caregivers are women of color with no insurance, sick leave, or other benefits. We could keep going with this list. We haven't even talked about gender, the elderly, the communal ramifications of social distancing and the economic shutdown, the morbidity and mortality secondary to loneliness, isolation, and job loss, the exacerbation in mental health issues from these same factors across all demographics across the country, the extraordinary trauma and moral distress experienced by frontline healthcare workers who weren't fired, the exponentially higher toll, sometimes called the black tax, on healthcare workers of color under these conditions, the unfathomable rejection of science and simple practices like mask wearing, all the result of long developing social factors that intersect clinical realities. Instead, I wanna spend the rest of our time displaying how this need to expand Catholic bioethics via the lens of Catholic social tradition is illuminated by the most recent pandemic issue, the COVID-19 vaccines. The Catholic social tradition calls us to analyze the vaccines through a lens shaped not only by principles of autonomy or utility, but by commitments to solidarity, subsidiarity, participation, preferential options for the poor and vulnerable, with a rigorous attention to politics and economics, and even perhaps theology, as modeled by Leo XIII in Rerum Novarum. And if anyone thinks that politics doesn't have anything to do with medical ethics, all we have to do is take one look at the name of the Russian COVID vaccine. What is more, at its heart, the Catholic social tradition is not just about principles, it's about social location. It calls us to change the place from which we do bioethics. In his most recent book, Let Us Dream, Pope Francis states, you have to go to the edges of existence if you want to see the world as it is. I've always thought that the world looks clearer from the periphery. You have to make for the margins to find a new future. The Catholic social tradition presses us to go to the peripheries, to move the table in the language of liberation theologians out of the hospital, out of the clinic, in order to listen to the people who live and work on the margins of society so that we will be able to authentically see and understand the practical and moral realities relevant to our practice of medicine and healthcare. So the question for our remaining time will be, how might our assessment of the moral and ethical aspects of the COVID-19 vaccines shift if we were to view them from the peripheries using the lens of the Catholic social tradition? Oops. Quick. <clears throat> so the vaccines. In early November, Pfizer announced that it was ready to release data from its phase three clinical trial with a novel mRNA vaccine. What good news when the data was released, 95% effective. In late December, vaccinations began. It was a moment of hope in a very dark year. Just as the bioethics infrastructure had geared up for triage of PPE and, ventil and ventilators in February, it now shifted into action to prioritize candidates for 
what for many months would be scarce doses of vaccines. As before, recommendations were shaped by the principles of bioethics. Candidates for the first tier, subdivided into three categories, uh, were chosen due to risk of mortality and risk of exposure, prioritizing those who would benefit the most in order to maximize the vaccine's utility. The tiers, which you have probably all memorized by now, 1A, healthcare personnel and long-term care, uh, long-term care facility residents, 1B, people over 75 and non-healthcare frontline essential workers, 1C, people 65 and up, uh, people with high risk medical conditions and essential workers not included in 1B. <clears throat> These criteria explicitly prioritize the demographic at highest risk of dying, the elderly, particularly the elderly in congregate living facilities. But despite the extraordinarily disproportionate morbidity and mortality within communities of color, the tiers do not explicitly prioritize people in these communities. Rather, acknowledgement of health disparities is included in the fine print on who counts as a 1B or 1C essential worker via caveats about the disproportionate impact on workers who belong to racial and ethnic minority groups. Thus, they are prioritized not as members of a vulnerable and hard hit community, but via employment. In response to these allocation guidelines and the vaccines in general, Catholic responses went in two directions. First, the first led by the Catholic Health Association largely affirmed the CDC allocation guidelines. Releasing principles to guide vaccine equity as early as July, CHA cites the Catholic social principles, dignity of the human person, common good, solidarity, subsidiarity, preferential option for vulnerable persons. Yet in the end, their guidelines differ little from those of the CDC and other secular agencies, emphasizing safety and efficacy, respect for human dignity, equitable just distribution and maximizing benefit. The other Catholic response has focused on the morality of the vaccines themselves. In fact, since the end of November, Catholic moral analysis and public commentary on the COVID-19 vaccines has focused almost exclusively on what has been dubbed the Catholic question, the possible connection between the vaccines and abortion. At issue is the fact that for many years, many biotech companies have used cell lines derived from two fetuses aborted in 1964 and 1970 in the development or testing of vaccines and medical therapies. Some Catholics are concerned that to receive the vaccine might make them morally complicit in the practice of abortion, or it may entail immoral cooperation with the evil of abortion. <clears throat> Although this question was essentially answered in 2005 by the Pontifical Academy for Life, this single question has dominated the discussion within Catholic bioethics and the Catholic press. Dozens of articles and statements analyzing the COVID-19 vaccines using the principle of moral cooperation have been published, confirming that the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines have almost no connection to the problematic cell lines, recognizing that other vaccines do or may have a connection but that the moral distance between them and the original abortions renders the vaccines morally acceptable, particularly given the lack of other options and the gravity of the pandemic. This position has been reaffirmed by the US Conference of Catholic Bishops, the Pontifical Academy for Life, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, and yes, Pope Francis. Episcopal bodies across the globe have exhorted Catholics to receive the vaccine, agreeing with the CDF, which states that, quote, from the ethical point of view, the morality of vaccination depends not only on the duty to protect one's own health, but also on the duty to pursue the common good. Yet a few bishops and Catholic pundits continue to declaim against the immorality of the vaccines and the discussion of this question continues. While a few commentators have tried to move the needle, exhorting Catholics and all Americans to receive the vaccine as an act of charity and solidarity, the Catholic imagination seems untouched by almost any other question and continues to limit bioethics to questions about individual decision-making about particular medical technologies. But what if we moved the table? What, if different, what different issues and questions might emerge if we were to view the COVID-19 vaccines from the peripheries, from the Englewood neighborhood in Chicago or the favelas of Rio or a clinic in Zambia? 
What issues might Catholic bioethicists see or what questions might we ask if we stood in one of those places? <clears throat> well, we would see a continued blindness to questions of racial justice. So as we saw, there's much debate about, about vaccines that use cell lines derived from aborted fetuses, but where is the conversation about Catholic complicity with racism as we use medical treatments derived from HeLa cell lines taken in 1951 from the tissue of Henrietta Lacks, pictured here. Consistency would suggest that we would be complicit in this racism when we received the polio vaccine, treatments for cancers, for blood disorders, and a myriad of other therapies. In addition, for all the rhetoric about commitment to addressing racial disparities as 2020 unfolded, as vaccinations roll out, we are seeing the usual story. In Chicago last week, over half of vaccine recipients were white, where vaccination rates for Blacks and Latinos stood at about 16%, well below their demographics in these cities, trends that we are seeing across the United States. Some of this is due, not surprisingly, to what the New York Times refers to as a, quote, confluence of obstacles including registration phone lines and websites that can take hours to navigate, lack of transportation or time off from jobs to get to appointments, as well as to excessively bureaucratic paperwork, which is difficult for the elderly and people of color to navigate. Other issues include white people monopolizing appointments in racial and ethnic communities, fragile vaccines being out of storage too long and expiring, and vaccine hesitancy among people of color due to deep-seated and reasonable mistrust of the health system. <clears throat> From other peripheries, we might see that by the end of 2021, the richer countries of the world are expected to vaccinate most or all of their citizens, as opposed to only 20% of the people in resource-constrained cons resource countries. When the vaccines were approved in December, uh, rich countries with only 14% of the world's population had reserved over half of the production of the eight most promising vaccines. The US and UK had purchased enough doses to vaccinate their populations three times over and Canada five times over. The World Health Organization estimates that it might take three to four years to achieve global herd immunity given these politics as usual. Not only is this unjust, it is deadly. One study found that such stockpiling by wealthy countries will result in almost twice as many fatalities globally. What other moral questions does this vaccine nationalism or vaccine apartheid raise? Not only will poor people or people in poorer countries continue to become sick and die and their economies continue to stall, deepening global health and economic inequities, but, has, but as has become frighteningly clear over the past month, as long as large parts of the world remain unvaccinated, the virus will continue to spread and mutate, potentially rendering our current vaccine effort useless. In other words, if the first world does not eradicate the virus from the rest of the world, new strains will arise, once again, potentially ravaging us and our economies. Thus, ironically, if for no other reason than self-interest, we must work in solidarity for the global common good. Or as we have recently heard, no one is safe until everyone is safe. So if Catholic bioethics is concerned about complicity, these global dynamics press us to ask hard questions about our own cooperation with skewed systems that continue to privilege the already privileged. <clears throat> From the peripheries, the COVID-19 vaccines revive longstanding questions about patent laws and monopolizing of the technology necessary to produce what the World Health Organization rightly names as a global public good. For example, while Pfizer might not have taken any public funds in 2020 specifically to develop the COVID vaccine, because it holds the patent to the vaccine, um, it, uh, it stands to make a significant profit. Yet the research behind all of these vaccines has been publicly funded for many years. And now, public money will be used to purchase the vaccines in large quantities. Just a couple of days ago, it was announced that Pfizer expects to make 4 billion in profit on 15 billion in gross revenues on its COVID-19 vaccine in 2021, making it the quote, highest, the second highest revenue generating drug anytime, anywhere. 
But it's not only pharmaceutical companies that are going to profit. Even before the vaccines were approved, stock prices for these firms shot up anywhere from 60 to 1,000% enriching investors. What moral questions are raised when a few profit from a system that denies low-cost life-saving medications to most of the people in the world? And again, if Catholics are interested in questions of complicity and cooperation, what questions are raised for those of us who, via our retirement accounts or our college accounts, benefit financially from life-denying profits? From the peripheries, it also becomes clear that moral wrangling over allocating scarce resources is in many ways a red herring. The real question is about privileging exorbitant profits over human lives. The World Health Organization estimates that providing global coverage of vac global vaccine coverage will cost about $35 billion. The UN further estimates that due to the economic impact of the pandemic, some 235 million people will need humanitarian aid in 2021. To meet this record need, they're calling for an additional 35 billion in humanitarian aid for 2021. While these sound like big numbers, they're not unachievable sums. Indeed, while health systems were experiencing record losses, for the ultra wealthy, the pandemic has, be, has been a financial windfall. The world's five centibillionaires, Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, Bill Gates, Bernard Arnault, and Mark Zuckerberg, have together gained 260 billion since the pandemic began, so since last March. Collectively, the 650 richest people in the world have increased their wealth during the pandemic by $1 trillion, right? 650 people, $1 trillion in 12 months. Were they to give 3.5% of just that new excess pandemic generated wealth, the UN 2020 humanitarian aid goal would be met. Were they to tithe, give 10%, just once, right, just for 2021, the global humanitarian crisis could be averted and a critical mass of people could be vaccinated across the globe and they would still have 900 billion in new profits left over. We could keep talking about issues. Let me quickly identify two more and then come to my conclusion. Are these, pro are these technologies appropriate? On one level, the mRNA vaccines are exciting new technologies, yet the dazzle of scientific breakthrough dims when viewed from the peripheries. For they need to be stored at seriously sub-zero temperatures, rendering them, rendering them impossible to transport and store over 30% of the world. What are vaccines that need multiple doses, given the logistical complexities in resource-poor settings, given the, the logistical complexities in the US? Right, We've seen how difficult this has been. Again, given that these technologies have been largely funded through public monies, what moral questions are raised when the biotech industry develops products that will work for the haves while ignoring the practical realities of the have-nots? From the peripheries, we also should ask how we evaluate the vaccine allocation tiers. Given the scarcity of trained healthcare personnel in resource-poor countries, might not the preferential option for the poor and commitments to equity recommend that they be prioritized for vaccination, perhaps even ahead of non-healthcare workers in richer countries? Paul Farmer posits that the preferential option for the poor suggests that the poor are more deserving of medical care than the rest of us. We might be reminded that while all healthcare workers are valuable, given the longstanding shortages in healthcare personnel in the global south, you know, Africa, for example, has just 3% of the world's healthcare workers to care for 11% of the world's population with 25% of the global disease burden. It is imperative that healthcare workers in resource poor contexts be prioritized and protected. These are Catholic questions. Questions about medicine and medical technologies that cry out to be asked when we reorient ourselves from the peripheries. As I hope this review has made clear, the moral dynamics at the root of many of these issues are not questions of autonomy or utility, but economics. The COVID pandemic and now the vaccines expose what Pope Francis describes as, quote, an economy that kills. 
a system that treats so many people as disposable, as cogs that can be thrown away. In Let Us Dream, he calls instead for, quote, an economy that sustains, protects, and regenerates, something he finds notably promoted by women economists. From a Catholic perspective, the COVID-19 vaccines ought not to be understood as a proprietary commodity or even simply as a global public good. Rather, they are a gift, a collective good from those who have for decades deployed God's gift of human reason in scientific pursuit and those who have volunteered their bodies for clinical trials, many of those bodies living notably among the peripheries. As such, the starting point for a Catholic perspective on the COVID-19 vaccines should not be one of scarcity or worse, moral hazard, but rather the principle of gratuity or gift. As both Francis and Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI have argued, gratuity is the engine of an economy, a politics and a culture that gives life. Gratuity opens up new avenues for freedom and cre creativity. At the global level, for example, it supports the practice of dose sharing, calling rich countries to share their vaccine stockpiles, especially their excesses, through the World Health Organization's COVAX framework. It likewise calls the global community to fully fund the COVAX initiative, a goal which, as we saw earlier, is certainly within reach. But the principle of gratuity also fun functions at the individual level. The effects of the pandemic on the elderly, communities of color, and the poor remind us of what Farmer once wrote that, quote, diseases themselves make a preferential option for the poor. Over the past year, divides between the poor and the rich have widened. For instance, and we have new, new divides as well, for, as, for instance, between those who can work from home and those who cannot, or as a Wall Street Journal columnist put it, between, quote, people who get a paycheck deposited in their bank account no matter what, and those who don't. What is the call of gratuity in this situation and how might it reconfigure the shape of vaccine line distribution? Might charity and solidarity encourage, encourage those of us who can move ourselves to the back of the line to do so? Ensuring that those who are at the greatest risk receive the vaccine before we do? Let me close with a final quote from Pope Francis. Again, in his book, Let Us Dream, he states, the basic rule of a crisis is that you don't come out of it the same. If you get through it, you come out better or worse, but never the same. This is the moment to dream big, to rethink our priorities. God asks us to dare to create something new. We cannot return to the false securities of the political and economic systems we had before the crisis. We need a politics that can integrate and dialogue with the poor, the excluded and the vulnerable that gives people a say in the decisions that impact their lives. We need to slow down, take stock, and design better ways of living together on this earth. We will not emerge from the COVID-19 pandemic the same. Will we emerge better with a moral framework grounded not in arcane philosophical principles, but in the vibrant heart of our theological tradition, that of gift? The Pontifical Academy asks, can this pandemic be the promise of a new beginning for the human community, the promise of life's rebirth? Such a new beginning, they note, will require a real conversion of minds and hearts. Equally, it will require a conversion of Catholic bioethics. Thank you. All right. I think I'm up. Um, I want to thank Professor Prusak for generously inviting me to speak tonight. I'm honored to be part of this event and to have a chance to respond to Professor Lysot's lecture. I want to begin by commending you, Professor Lysot, for highlighting important moral problems that haven't received enough attention and cry out for solutions, both in Catholic bioethics and in wider secular bioethics. I'm sympathetic to your central thesis that contemporary bioethics needs to be expanded and enhanced and perhaps even revolutionized by the key insights of Catholic social teaching. <clears throat> now, I should issue a disclaimer that unlike you, Therese, I'm not a theologian with expertise in moral theology or theological bioethics. I'm just a lowly philosopher, um, but I'll do my best to fulfill the classical role of being a handmaid to theology 
by raising four questions for further discussion, two of them specific and critical and two of them more general and open-ended. So the first one concerns vaccine nationalism. You maintain that vaccine nationalism is unjust. And my question is, what exactly is vaccine nationalism and why is it unjust? One possible meaning is nationalistic ignoring, not considering the interests of anyone outside of one's own nation. It's not hard to defend the injustice of this attitude on the basis of solidarity and the duty to care for the common good of humanity. A second possible meaning is nationalistic hoarding, stockpiling more vaccines than the nation's inhabitants need and can use. This practice too is clearly unjust because it wastes resources that could be used to benefit others in dire need. The third possible interpretation is the one described in the Vatican document that you cite, where states attempt to gain the vaccine faster than others and with the idea of obtaining the necessary quantity for their inhabitants first. We can call this nationalistic prioritization, giving priority to vaccinating one's own inhabitants before people in other nations. And I think it's considerably harder to defend the claim that this practice is unjust. The issue here, it seems to me, is whether governments have the same obligations toward people in other countries as to their own inhabitants. Common sense morality and the Catholic moral tradition, especially the natural law and virtue traditions, affirm the existence of duties of special relationship or associative duties, the idea that we have stronger obligations toward our nearest and dearest, grounded in certain kinds of morally significant relations. Some examples are that parents have a stronger duty to care for their own children than for other children. Physicians have a stronger obligation to care for their own patients than other doctors' patients. And nations have a stronger duty to promote the interests of their own inhabitants than to promote the interests of people in other countries. These special obligations can be classified under the principle of Catholic social teaching that's sometimes labeled rights and responsibilities. As a matter of distributive justice, states have special responsibilities toward their citizens and citizens have special rights against the state. Now, it can be argued that these special rights and responsibilities justify, or maybe even require, the practice of prioritizing one's own inhabitants for vaccination. If governments have a special responsibility, but not a sole responsibility, to care for their own people first, and this is weightier than their responsibility to care for people in other nations, it would support vaccinating their own citizens before others. This principle is in tension with the principle of solidarity if solidarity is interpreted to mean that we should give equal consideration to the interests of all human beings, regardless of which national community they belong to. So if vaccine nationalism is supposed to mean nationalistic prioritization, then I think more argument is needed to show that it's unjust. That is to say that solidarity takes priority over the special rights and responsibilities that I'm highlighting. The second question concerns the principle of gratuity, which you discussed at the end of your lecture. So you maintain that the starting point for a Catholic perspective on the COVID-19 vaccines must not be scarcity, but rather the principle of gratuity or gift. My question here is, um, can you explain the principle of gratuity in more detail by elaborating on what it is and how it applies to vaccine distribution? I might not be understanding it correctly, and I'm open to, to being corrected on this score. Most of all, can you say more about why gratuity is more appropriate than scarcity? I don't doubt that gratuity is essential in some contexts, but I have doubts that it's the most important consideration when it comes to COVID vaccines. There are reasons to think that scarcity, more precisely the justice of distributing scarce resources, is the more important perspective here. The vaccines are a gift to be sure, but right now they're a life-saving gift in very limited supply and decisions have to be made about who should get the gift and in what order. Gratuity seems more appropriate when there's an abundance or enough of the good in question. And the document that you cited from the Pontifical Academy for Life describes gratuity in, along these lines as, quote, willingly giving of one's excess to respond to the call for the survival of the poor and the sustainability of the entire planet. But assuming we're talking or not talking about nationalistic hoarding uh, or stockpiling, Excess is not the situation with the vaccines right now, at least. The hard question of a distributive justice must be answered. Given that the demand for vaccine outstrips the supply, what's the most just way to allocate these scarce resources? A justice perspective is different from a gift perspective, and arguably it should take precedent in situations of scarcity. 
More fundamentally, when it comes to the di distribution of goods, justice is prior to gifts. Here's what I mean. Something can be, a, can be just without being a gift, but not vice versa. Justice is a necessary condition for morally good gifts. If I act gratuitously and give someone a gift, but I act unjustly in the process, then I haven't acted in a morally good way, I've engaged in moral wrongdoing. For example, if I were to accept every request to join a university committee or referee a paper or co-author a paper or teach an extra class, give a lecture, sponsor a club, attend yet another Zoom meeting and other altruistic things I might do in my capacity as a professor, I would be using my scarce resources of time and energy in a gratuitous way as a gift to others. Let's just assume that I would actually be helping. But if I did all that, while at the same time blowing off my family and not sparing an hour for them because I was too busy giving to others, I'd be acting unjustly and my giving would be morally undermined. My family has a morally prior claim, a right to my time and energy, and I have a weightier obligation toward them that takes precedent over my obligation to give to others. The point here is that in order for my gifts to be morally good, they must not be given at the expense of justice. What this means, I think, is that when we're dealing with the distribution of goods, scarce resources, we must first attend to considerations of justice and know what justice requires before we can engage in morally good acts of gratuity. So in light of that, I'd like to hear more about why you think that gratuity is the main perspective we should adopt for vaccines. My last two questions will be a lot shorter and they won't be friendly objections dressed up as questions, I promise. The third uh, question is about generalization. So I'm curious, do you, does your argument generalize to all scarce medical resources or maybe all life-saving resources like blood products or ventilators or ECMO machines or organ transplants? If not, why not? Would it be arbitrary to restrict the conclusion to COVID vaccines alone? Why doesn't it also apply to scarce medical resources more generally? Given that the same kinds of injustices and healthcare disparities that you mentioned also apply to most of these other treatments too. If it does generalize, then it will probably entail a radical shift in the principles of distributive justice governing healthcare. And this will be met with significant resistance, both principled and unprincipled. Now, maybe this is exactly what you have in mind by calling upon a spirit of revolutionary change. Um, but in any case, I'm curious to know if you would apply the same line of reasoning to things other than vaccines and what that might look like. And fourth and finally, um, the question is what can we do? So this is a big question, um, but I think it's a practically important one. For those of us who agree with you that these large scale moral problems exist and demand new solutions, but are wondering what individuals can do about it, since these problems might seem like bigger ones that only bigger entities like governments or corporations have the power to change, what can we as individuals do to help move things in the right direction? And I'll end just by referring back um, to a joke uh, that you made. I think you made it in the lecture. You had it in your paper, so um, I didn't invent the joke. But uh, you mentioned that with all that's happened recently, you can now write Catholic Bioethics and Social Justice Volume 2, the sequel COVID edition. And I do hope that you actually write that book someday. Um, but for tonight, feel free to leave any of my questions for the sequel, if you want. Oh, thank you. I did take that joke out, but I'm so glad you put it back in. <laughs> I'm glad uh, I added that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. OK, so uh, Bernard, we have another hour, right? Uh, <laughs> so that we can answer plenty these of questions. time, plenty of time. Uh, um, uh, these are all great questions. And um, I also had a line in there that I think I took out um, every single issue I raised. You could spend an hour, at least an hour, talking about each one of them, right? So, right, this was this big sort of impressionist painting, uh, you know, getting a lot on the table. Um, and I think you asked good questions. That, oh, I have good answers for them. I don't know if we have enough time to get them all back, but we'll see if we can. Um, you know, what can we do? I'll, I'll start at the bottom and I'll work up. Um, uh, I always tell my students that I, I hope they leave my 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 classes with with no answers only questions, right? So I'm very glad that I didn't leave you with a, the sense of what we can do. Because I really think the, the, the most important thing we can do now is to start to change how people think about these things, how they see them, right? Part of moving the table is, is reorienting our perspective, right? There's a, there's a line and I forget who it comes from. It's either Stanley Hauerwas or Leonardo Boff and they're not the same person. So how you could confuse these, I don't know. But 
you can only act in a world you can see, right? So the first, the most important thing we have to do is to see correctly, right? We have to, and, and, and generally we have little frameworks that, that tell us what we can see, right? And the principles of bioethics are a framework that within this framework, they help us see things, but they also blind us to a lot of stuff. And I think what we've seen in COVID is that that framework as a framework for bioethics it really is not adequate to the realities of the world and the, and the realities of the moral issues involved with medicine, right? So the first thing to do is to start reframing. So then how do we do that? Well, that's a big project. Um, does, does this generalize to all scarce resources? If not, why not? That's a really good question. My first answer was no, my second answer was yes. Um, I do think that a global pandemic of this nature does require a different response. Right. Um, partly because, as I said, you know, if it, uh, we're not safe, nobody's safe until we're all safe, right? Which is different than a lot of other sorts of health issues. So, just on that level, it does call for a different sort of response. We're in this current boat together. Um, and maybe this should help us think about how to change the way we've responded to some of the other issues. Um, it, you know, you said it's gonna. It would require us to change the the fundamental principles of distributive justice in healthcare. Well, I actually think that would be okay because I think the ones we have right now are not doing such a great job, <laughs> right? They ex they distribute a lot of stuff to really wealthy people and nothing to poor people, right? And you know, you can see the map I put up of the vaccines, um, you know, showing Africa in red and the rest of the world in green or yellow. That's the that's the same map of everything else, right? You know, disease burden. Um, ventilators, you know, you name a resource, that's how it's distributed. That's not a just distributed, just system, right? So I'm not, I don't have much stake in protecting the one we have right now. Um, uh, and we could talk obviously way more about that. Um, do, 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 oh, these other two, uh, really complicated questions, really good, really important. Um, uh, da, 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 da. Let me take the first one first about vaccine nationalism. You identified because you're a philosopher, you identified three different kinds and <laughs> all the issues with them. And I really appreciate it. I thought that was really interesting. Right. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think that um, but uh, while we do have, right, in the Catholic tradition, there are you know duties to your, your nearby neighbors. Um, uh, it, partly I'm also trying to do a theological thing, right? Who is my neighbor? Um, uh, I'm looking at my notes here. Um, uh, but, but because we're in this pandemic, you know, does it call for a different sort of response? I cut a huge chunk out of the paper talking about the World Health Organization. Right? So, you know, US is really good at vaccinating ourselves, UK, Canada, Japan, you know, everybody's doing nationalism, you know, getting their resources, hoarding, whatever we're doing. Um, the World Health Organization is looking out for everybody else, right? So they've developed this COVAX initiative, um, which is designed to try to try to vaccinate the rest of the world. Um, and they have really great uh, principles, six or eight principles, very deeply aligned with Catholic social thought. Uh, but the way they're doing it is, okay, all these people who are participating in their initiative, which is like a lot of countries, 90 countries, I don't know, some big number, um, everybody gets 3% first. 3% of their population, or they get enough vaccine for 3% of their population so that they can vaccinate their healthcare workers, right? Every country. Then everybody gets up to 20%, right? So nobody gets more than 20% until everybody has 20%. And they so they've got it set up. So for all of these countries, there really is a just system of distribution. That's amazing, right? Um, and this is what they're trying to roll out. So I think that you know we could have more conversation about this, uh, but I think partly in terms of this, um, you know, that it's a global pandemic of a, a new, a, a novel sort of thing. Um, but yeah, if we were to actually participate in the World Health Organization and contribute to their activity, we could do this too, right? We could say, right, we're not going to vaccinate our healthcare workers, or anybody besides our healthcare workers, till everybody has, right? Because everybody's healthcare workers are really important. It's a pandemic. Right? Then we'll go to 20%, everybody at 20%, good, we'll go further. We could do that. Um, partly because we have the means to also protect those of us who are working at home getting our paycheck, um, which is very different than a lot of countries. So we could talk more about that. Um, but I think it goes back to this last point too about gifts and justice, which comes first. 
you're a philosopher, I'm a theologian. So I would say gift comes first <laughs> and we could have a conversation about this. Uh, you know, this is uh, basically one of the questions in uh, Benedict XVI's Deus Caritas Est, right? What's the relationship between love and justice, um, uh, charity and justice? Um, and I think that there, you know, there are a lot of examples out there, um, not, not, not a lot, not enough, but a few examples out there where ch gift is the engine that creates justice, right? So for the COVAX initiative, they're relying on donations from around the world, right? Uh, and so under the previous uh, presidential regime in our country, uh, we were not participating in the World Health Organization or the COVAX initiative. The Biden administration, one of the th first things it did was it rejoined the World Health Organization and it, we we're gonna donate $11 billion to the COVAX initiative. Great, right? So GIFT is gonna enable them to roll out a just uh, distribution platform, right? So I really think they go together. Um, uh, but I've also long taught, uh, Paul Farmer is, you know, one of my sort of uh, heroes in medical ethics. I so hope many of you have read him. Um, but his work was also, the, the primary step was, was gift, right? He went to Haiti, gave himself, didn't make any money, and radically reshaped how we think about justice and global health. Right, made, made a huge transition in the, in the world of global health and, and our imagination and in our practices and in our outcomes from one person's gift. Um, and then if we go back theologically, of course, right, uh, the, the, the fundamental nature of God is gift, right? Gift in creating the world, um, the principle of universal destination of goods, which means that everything is given first, given for everybody to meet their basic needs. Then we have justice after that. Um, uh, Jesus in becoming incarnate, giving of himself, right? So I think for, as a theologian, we put gift first. Um, some of us, I should say, put gift first. And I'm making this argument to Catholics, so I would like them to move their imaginations in that direction. That's like way too insufficient answers to really good questions. <laughs> No, thank you. No, no, that was really helpful for me to understand. And I think you, you answered all the questions. So I think I, I won't respond. I want to open it up for, for other people to talk. But that last point, I think I completely am with you on everything you said. Um, and maybe I was not as precise as I could have been or tried to be. I agree with you that charity is the supreme obligation virtue, right? More important than justice. My point was a lot more restricted to in this particular kind of situation where there's a question of a scarce resource that we don't have enough of, and it's really important, right? People will die without it. It seems to me that we have to answer the question of distributive justice first before we can invoke the gift perspective, if only because justice seems to be a necessary condition for a gift to be good, right? right. So the right. Paul Farmer example, I would say, if he were to have gone to Haiti, I think you said, but he would have abandoned his family, right, Gauguin style, <laughs> then oh. that would have been unjust and it wouldn't have been a morally good gift or an act of charity, right? Um, so right. I was, but, but if I more, could, yeah. In response, right, so, um, so part of the question currently, uh, activists are out there about the patent question, right? Yeah, you know, um, so we're in this global pandemic, publicly funded, I know, we'll get some Q and A, what question? Um, uh, they argue that Pfizer, because they have received public monies, should give the patent, right? Should Everybody should be able to make these drugs, right? We should be able to upscale production in India, in the United States, in you know, University of Wisconsin, like whoever, can, whoever has the capacity should be able to upscale and make these drugs, right? Because, um, because that would solve the scarcity issue. But because they hold the patent, and they want a profit, they're not sharing it, right? So gift could seed justice. But- I would, I would say that that would be an injustice. <laughs> well, no, they could, it would be willing. They would, because they've received, right? So where do we start with the gift? Right. All right, I'm gonna to have to interrupt. That was a, a superb exchange. Thank you very much, Matt. Great questions and Therese, excellent presentation. So much to think about. Um, I'd like to continue that that exchange myself, but we're going to turn to the, the Q&A and we'll hear your, your voices again. 
So a lot of different questions here, some uh, quite broad and some uh, much more specific. So let me begin with some questions about uh, vaccine distribution, and then we'll work our way out to these broader questions. So one question is whether there are any statistics specific to vaccine distribution in the healthcare system based on race. So you began, Therese, by uh, you know, referencing our continued blindness to racial justice. So when you you look at some of these bioethical issues from the peripheries, that's what you note, racial justice. Can you talk a little bit about um, whether they're statistics or what trends we're seeing with respect to vaccine distribution uh, and race? Yeah, I, um, oh, I could go see, uh, the CDC is starting to track some of that. It's the, um, no, is it the CDC? Yeah, the CDC. I don't know, maybe it's John Hopkins. Um, uh, the vaccines haven't been rolling out very long, right? So there's not that much data. Um, uh, we could go to the New York Times, we could find out, you know, was there 1.8 million doses have been given or some people vaccinated. Um, so we're still pretty early in the data. So the reports that are coming back are very ad hoc, mostly in the newspaper, right, city to city. And the ones that I've seen over the last week have just been grim, right? So some Philadelphia, um, you know, I think I read today, 44% uh, African-American population in Philadelphia, 16% have been vaccinated where, you know, a really high percent of white folks have been vaccinated. Uh, same thing in uh, Chicago, same thing in New York. Um, and, and there's reports that, you know, so white folks are making appointments at the clinics in the, you know, in the inner city where they never go for anything else, right? But now that the vaccine is available, they're taking up those appointments um, or, you um, you know, the system is just not rolling out the way that we had hoped it would, given what we saw over the summer. Similar question, though, this has to do with age in, instead. So uh, another former student of mine, that first question came in from a former student too, notes that uh, vaccine distribution's hardly gone as smoothly as we might hope in the United States, and particularly in Pennsylvania. She's a, a fifth year PA student and on her clinical rotations, many elderly patients ask how to get their vaccines. The sign up uh, method in place is online, which a lot of older people don't have access to. Right. And many vaccine appointments are during the day, which sometimes isn't available to essential workers as well. Right. What, what's a better vaccine rollout? So, hey. <laughs> Solve this for us. Well, they asked me back in November, right? But this is this, right? This is why you move the table, right? Did nobody go sit with a bunch of elderly people and say, let's think about how this would work from your perspective, right? Or go into an African American community and say, okay, if we put this together, is this going to work? It's just sounding to me like they didn't like go and get that feedback, right? They, they took a sort of uh, a highly technical process that works for like, People who work in universities and healthcare uh, healthcare organizations and said, "Oh, this will work for everybody," you know, instead of getting the knowledge necessary to make it work. Um, uh, and but people who know these folks, right? Uh, you know, lots of my friends um, who have elderly parents, right? They're all saying, "Who came up with this system?" Right? Because they spend a lot of time with their mom, right? They know that their dad, you know, can text but can't really do anything else. Um, yeah. So people who accompany those on the margins tend to have knowledge of this. Why this hasn't been part of the process is sort of confusing to me. Sad, not shopping. Matt, <laughs> if at any point you, you want to contribute, you don't have to just sit there uh, silently. So unmute yourself. If you want, if you want. Um, sure. These questions are above my pay grade, I think so far. <laughs> well, um, Couple more about vaccine distribution, and and uh, then again broader. And we'll go until about you know a little after eight fifteen, maybe so another ten plus minutes. So a question about um, you know what might be done, how change might be brought about. So your your argument is is framed in terms of Catholic social thought. Um, you know this question actually suggests maybe that's a stronger. Uh, perspective than uh, philosophical theories such as utilitarianism or Kant's categorical imperative. What the, if you did want to, you know, change the, uh, you know, the conversation, and you know, call into question the vaccine nationalism 
um, however we're to identify that. Uh, what, what do you think the strongest framework is? Do you think this, this framework of Catholic social thought speaks generally to people, or is it, is it unduly sectarian, so on and so forth? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mean, on the one hand, it would be good if Catholics would start taking Catholic social thought more seriously, right? Working out of that framework integrated with its other ones, right? Right now they're they're in silos often, right? There's Catholic social thought and then theology or moral theology or moral philosophy or whatever, and they're they're not integrated, right? So part of my call is simply to get Catholics to sort of know what our tradition is, right? And start to work out of it and help it re reach, uh, reshape our imaginations um, uh, and reshape our, our wills and our hearts and, uh, right? Because, you know, essential to the Catholic moral tradition is, is um, what our will is doing, right? And if I'm living under a, a world of scarcity, right? I'm, I'm afraid, right? My will wants to like get mine. Um, but if I'm shaped by a, a notion of gratuity or charity, right? Maybe my will will bend in a different direction, right? Toward toward giving it to someone, oh, who may be slightly less uh, privileged than me, right? Or starting to, you know, sh reshape who I am. It, you know, again, right? This could be a multi-chapter book. It was a multi-chapter paper, and I, you know, cut about half of it out. Um, I, I do think, in many ways, that the secular sphere is is ahead of the Catholic tradition, right? So. Um, uh, you know, these arguments about vaccine nationalism, patents, um, uh, the, the COVAX framework at the World Health Organization, you know, these were all developed by secular folks. These, you know, maybe there's some Catholics floating in the background, um, you know, like they were for the, you know, UN uh, Human Rights Doc uh, Declaration, right? Very shaped by Catholics, but it's in very secular language. Um, uh, but in many ways, the, the secular community outside the United States is ahead of the Catholics. Um, so, uh, so I, I think that there's a lot of resonance. Uh, this would be a great point of contact between uh, a Catholic perspective um, and uh, other political perspectives and secular perspectives. Um, but we just need to sort of get up to speed with our own perspective first. There are so many questions and I'm not gonna be able to, to uh, pose all the questions. So apologies to people if you do not hear your question. I'll, I'll do my best here. So I can send them later. I'll be happy to answer them. Yeah, I'll send some along if I can save them. I'll, I'll have to do that before ending the meeting. Um, so how, how can we include uh, voices from the global south in this discussion? So, uh, so far, the arguments over vaccine distribution uh, you know, seem to be dominated by uh, voices in or perspectives from richer countries. Maybe that's not true. Um, so it seems. H how do you hear voices from the, the global south? What are voices in the global south saying, for that matter? Um, right. So for me, for this for this project, I, was, I asked a whole bunch of people who work there, right? I was like, tell me what you think about the vaccine, <laughs> right? It wasn't, you know, well, how do you see these things from your perspective? Um, and they added a whole bunch of stuff that I didn't, you know, even talk about, um, uh, about, um, you know, partly how this this issue again has unmasked the problems that they've been dealing with, you know, for decades and decades. Um, that there's more fundamental issues that need to be addressed, right? Um, you know, part of the part of the reason that the Pfizer vaccine you know, really isn't going to work in in Zambia is because of infrastructure. Well, that infrastructure is a problem for delivering lots of other things, right? So the fundamental issue is to we need to work on the infrastructure. Um, uh, I think part of it, um, you know, there's a sort of exhaustion of, you know, because of course when this all first happened in March, you know, richer countries were hoarding PPE and ventilators and whatnot, right? So this is just kind of, you know, round two of the same old thing that happened. Um, so, um, but, you know, the way to do it is to, is to talk to people who are there, right? Um, uh, physicians, healthcare workers on the ground in Lima and Zambia and uh, South Africa and, and hear their perspectives. Um, Great. How do we do that? Wait. Let's uh, broaden a little bit beyond um, you know, the excellent and important example of, of vaccine distribution. There's a, a question here noting that racism, poverty, and sexism are all traumas 
and this person would like to hear a little bit more about uh, how trauma contributes to people's vulnerability to disease, including COVID, and what might be done to address these these underlying issues and you know, a, a culture of violence. So another rather broad question. Okay, I got another hour. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe another example. So what, what other issue, for example, uh, traumas? Yeah, no, that's right. Because actually I have a whole bunch of not a lecture I give on trauma and, and race also. Um, yeah. Right, trauma, um, uh, you know, those who work on questions of race, gender, class, economics, um, you know, talk about how all this stuff is embodied, right? There's this constant embodied assault um, over time, structures of violence, structures of sin, take its toll on us um, in ways that on the one hand display as, you know, kind of standard diseases, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, obesity, um, uh, but they also manifest, um, um, you know, just in terms of um, stress responses, right, or trauma responses. Um, uh, and so that can inhibit, um, you know, if, if, you, if you've grown up in a traumatic neighborhood um, and some of the people who have pervaded the trauma are healthcare workers or, who are supposed to be there, you know, helping you at the local clinic, but, but they, they treat you badly. Um, this is going to um, trigger you every time you approach a healthcare worker, right? Um, and so there might be this negative protective response, um, even to something that's good, in addition to the physiological toll that it takes on our bodies, both from the initial trauma and then from the sort of ongoing um, unresolved trauma over the years. Um, uh, and this is why there's a lot of vaccine hesitancy in African-American communities, right? They don't, they don't trust the medical system and they probably shouldn't trust the medical system um, given what it has done and what it's currently, you know, continues to do, these stories come out. Um, so, you know, for Catholic healthcare that's often located in um, minority serving uh, neighborhoods, um, addressing local trauma would be a really important first step in um, improving healthcare for the community, right? Uh, Catholic health systems or, or any nonprofit health system has to do a community health needs assessment every three years, you know, hear from the community what the needs are. Um, uh, I've never seen trauma on a community health needs assessment. That would be really interesting to, to measure, right? Or to look for and to try to think, how do I as Little Company of Mary Hospital in on the south side of Chicago, right? How do I implement a, a, a trauma, um, uh, post-traumatic growth process for people in the neighborhood, right? What kind of health outcomes, positive health outcomes might that uh, trigger? Trigger is probably not the right word, but you know, <laughs> that's a really great question. That's a huge area of research. One, one last question, and, and I apologize. In fact, I'll email a few people um, with my apology that I was unable to pose your question. Uh, this is the, the biggest and the broadest of the questions, believe it or not. And uh, Matt, I ask you to speak to this one too. Uh, this is really asking for an opinion. So uh, you, you noted, Therese, you were quoting Pope Francis that uh, you don't emerge the same from a crisis. You emerge either better or worse. Are, are we emerging? This is the, the broad question. Are we emerging better or are we emerging worse? So um, as you see us, let's hope, emerging from the pandemic, is that possible? Are we emerging? <laughs> is there such a hope on the horizon? What, what, what would you say? Is it, is it looking better or worse? And perhaps in particular, Therese, now, again, from the perspective of the peripheries, so moving the table, looking at things yeah. from an angle. What would you say? Um, Pope Francis lives the theological virtue of hope. Um, <laughs> so um, he does tend to be very optimistic. Uh, I don't, you know, I felt last summer uh, that we would learn more from this situation than we appear to have learned. Uh, and as the vaccine is rolling out, I'm a little less optimistic that we're going to come out differently. Um, but, uh, but maybe it's not night and day, right? You can't have night and day. Um, 
maybe it's the case that um, enough people have a different kind of consciousness coming out, both um, from all experiencing this together, um, from realizing what we've lost over the year and what is really important, um, in addition to a much higher consciousness, at least in the United States, of, of uh, the centuries of racial injustice and how they continue to play out. So it's probably both and. You know, a lot of our systems are still in place, and um, um, but if we give up hope, of course, then we won't come out better. So, Matt, what would you say? Um, maybe maybe wait, from wait. from the perspective of of your your work at UCLA, for that matter. Yeah, so, no, ending with a really easy okay. question. Um, yeah, no, it's not. <laughs> I, I think I agree with with Therese. Fundamentally, it's a mixed bag, like so many other things in human life. So I assume the question is about, you know, are we morally better or worse as a as a culture or community? I think there's evidence of both. Um, so it seems like you know people's concern for the well being of others, at least most people in my observation, um, my kind of armchair sociological observation. There is a heightened awareness of the interconnectedness of all of us and those communal bonds and solidarity, right, in a real sense, and concern for that, right, how your actions affect others in a way that we probably weren't aware of before. And I think that's to the good. Probably an awareness of the fragility of life and vulnerability um, and the gift of life. Um, we don't take it for granted, at least I think it's a really natural reaction that you don't take for granted a lot of the good things that we might have before being able to visit people in person and travel and just um, have your health, right? Not have fear, an atmosphere of fear. Um, and appreciation for, I think, members of society that, again, were overlooked um, and underappreciated, right? Essential workers, whatever that means. But at the very least, I think we're looking to see the value and the contribution people make who might have been seen as not too useful from kind of a social utility perspective. And now I think it's good. It's good that we're recognizing that. But of course, you know, there's a downside too um, with increased kind of selfishness and worrying about your own self or your own clan to the exclusion of others. Um, the kind of assertion of a, I think, pernicious kind of individualism about rights, um, a, a deeply unchristian understanding of rights is kind of your own entitlements um, and other people really can't encroach on those, right? You see it with the kind of some of these refusals to take precautions. Um, from my experience, as you asked Bernard in the hospital setting, um, I don't know. I think one of the best things to come out of it and from my perspective is an increased attention to justice. Justice was the least loved of the, you know, the standard bioethical principles, problematic though they may be. Um, at the very least now where we are less focused on autonomy and more focused on justice and uh, injustice. Right, these kinds of background problems that have been there for a long time and have had bad effects for well before COVID, now they are um, unable to be ignored. Right, they're in our face, and we see the devastation all the time. Uh, and and I think Therese pointed out, you know, very effectively, a lot of those trends. So, the fact that it's made these problems unable to be ignored anymore, I think, is good because we're almost forced to attend to them. Justice has a lot more attention in contemporary bioethics, these background disparities, all of these things um, are, at least it seems to me, much more on the radar than they were before all of this happened. And I think that's a good thing. Thank you very much. Thank you for those closing reflections from both of you. Thank you for an excellent presentation, Therese and Matt. Great questions, great exchange. Thank you everyone for your, your questions. That was a, for me, very, uh, insightful and and educational q a all right Wait. that's it thank, yeah thank you matt especially for wow those were great questions i'm going to be thinking about them i'm going to be emailing you some answers or sure. responses. Yeah. Uh, uh and definitely um i would be happy to um receive any of the questions either that you posted or uh, otherwise because it's an important topic and it's just right we need people talking about it and thinking about it and um continuing the conversation so Thank you very much. And thanks to all our audience too. Good night, everybody.